Now, you may want to get hold of that Bible and look at page 877, because, uh, as Ian said, that's the story we're going to try and look at this evening. Uh, look, I've called it the man who nearly, nearly had it all. I think that's what the story's about. Let's just jump in. It'll tell itself if we, if we go with it, right? He, he, the man who nearly had it all. Look at verse 18 on page 877, chapter 18. And a ruler, oh, he's, he's called the rich ruler. Do you see that little subheading there? It's been edited to say that. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, asked Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, stick with me at the start here because uh, I, I'm claiming some things about him. There you go, look, verse 18, he's a ruler. I hope he's a good ruler. I wouldn't mind being a ruler, would you? So that's, that's decent. That's a good start in life. He's a ruler. He's very polite. Look at 18. Very nice bloke. Sounds like Ben. Anyway, very nice bloke. Good teacher. Isn't that nice? Good teacher. Respectful to Jesus. What, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Right. Ruler. Very polite. And look at verse 23. Do you, do you see it there? He's rich. Oh, ho. hang on. Hang on now. Ruler, rich, very nice. He's only missing one thing, or he would have it all. Look closely. It doesn't say anywhere that he's Welsh. Oh, poor bloke, he could have had the whole lot. <laughs> no, that's a joke, right? <laughs> we, Mark writes, uh, this, is a, this story is in the three of the four accounts of the life of Jesus. And actually, at the end of this story, in, in Mark's account of the narrative, he adds to the story, uh, at the end of the story, uh, that, that Jesus was sad for the man at the end. Jesus looked at him and loved him, it says. There was something, there's clearly something about this man's approach that bears a, at least a, a degree of authenticity as he comes to Jesus. So, why did he nearly have it all? Well, I think the story's pretty straightforward. See what you think when we go through it. I think Jesus gives the guy three chances, not one, not even two, he gives him three chances to see that the question he asks very politely is the wrong question. In fact, it's so wrong that the guy clearly hasn't got a clue what eternal life means. L look again closely at 18. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, all I want us to try and do, if you're willing to join in with me on this, is to look at this story and I'll walk you through what I think are the three separate attempts that Jesus makes to get the guy to see that you can't do anything to get eternal life. It's that straightforward. Let's have a go. Here's his first opportunity, verse 19. Now, I've, I've called it, are you perfect? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. So I think that's strike one. Hi, Jesus, really nice to meet you. Um, I'm pretty interested, really, in what you have to say. It's piqued my interest. I, I, um, I like this eternal life idea. I'm really up for giving it my best shot. I'm pretty used to cutting deals, he might have said. You know, I've got good emotional intelligence. You can see I'm pretty respectful. I, I'm genuinely thinking about my eternity. Could we come to, come, come to an arrangement on this one? Because I think I'd be up for it. 
I think that's the tone of voice that's going on here. Jesus immediately confronts him by saying, why do you call me good? Good teacher. Uh, no one's good. So he questions his use of good. The assumption is that the young man has a not unreasonable belief that he's a decent bloke. Uh, why wouldn't he? I mean, we know what real bad eggs are like, don't we? Wasters. We know what they're like. And sometimes we, we meet people who are unbelievable saints. I mean, they seem perfect. Me, I, I'm sort of in the middle, really. I'm really not a loser. Well, no, that's wrong. I am a loser. I'm not a waster. <laughs> I'm not perfect. So, okay. this is, I think this is the approach. Do you think it's quite normal? Look, I'm interested in Christianity. Yeah, I'm interested in, in what the Christian faith has to say. I think it's a pretty reasonable thing. The Christian I know, or one or two Christians, are, good, I like them. I mean, I know their faults because I know them well, but I, I, real good people. I think I could have a go at it, and I'd like to be good enough. What have I got to do? Give me the rules. She says, look, no one's good except God. I mean, pretty polite way to say silly, silly starting point. No one's good enough. So clearly, he's saying to the bloke, you're not good enough. Wrong starting point. I don't know what that says to you, because... For the most part, as far as I understand it, I became a Christian after university. And, and certainly, for the most part, my understanding, well, actually without question, was Christianity was about doing your very best to attain a high bar. And the whole place Jesus, the whole role Jesus had in this was that you would go to Jesus, initially at least, and say, look, I'm pretty interested in being a Christian. I'm going to go for it. Give me a hand to make sure I keep doing it well and I'm good enough. Just give me a head, a foot up, and I'll join in. Jesus says, no one's good enough. Wrong starting point. Let's have a look at uh, what happens next. Here's the second opportunity that Jesus gives him, because clearly, whatever it is, body language, eyes, whatever it is, the conversation keeps going without the young man saying anything. Here we go. Strike two, verses 20 to 21. Jesus changes gear completely. You, you know the commandments, ten commandments. All Jewish kids would have known the ten commandments. They'd have learned it at Saturday school. They, they'd have known it since they were little. You know the commandments. Now watch what happens here. This is fascinating. I, well, it is to me. I, see what you think. There are ten commandments. First four commandments are about the relationship between us and God. You shall have no other gods before me, for example. It's between me and God. I'm doing it horizontally, uh, vertically. You see what I'm saying? It's between me and God. The second six are social. They're social commandments. How we treat each other. Watch this. Watch them with me. You can count if you like. You know the commandments, he says to the guy. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't lie, bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, got it, five. But he leaves out one of the social commandments. Four about me and God, six about me and other people. The six would have always gone together. Jesus lists five of the six, misses one out. Now this gets interesting. No one's good enough, son. No one's good enough. I love the way you behave. I love your approach, but uh, wrong starting point. What do I do? You can't do anything. No one's good enough. I'll tell you what. Let me try another angle, Jesus might have said. You know the commandments? Yeah, yeah. G good. Um, what about these? And he lists the five of the so six social ones. And in verse 21, the lad says, all these I've kept from my youth. Now, in a minute, we'll do the third option Jesus gives him. He gives him one more chance, right? But at this point, I think it looks as if the boy's got to go for bluff. 
He's got a, he, I, either Jesus made a mistake, highly unlikely that Jesus doesn't know the sixth social commandment. And I'm not telling you what it is yet, you notice that. Uh, <laughs> highly unlikely that he's forgotten it, because everybody knew it. So the boy must know that Jesus has left it out. And he doesn't, look, he doesn't miss a beat. All these I have kept, the young man said. Oh, no, he's gone for the bluff with Jesus. He's gone for it. Oh, what a mug. You really shouldn't. You really shouldn't. He's gone for it. Uh, some years ago, I, I, I did an assembly uh, for year 10, actually, at, at a school in, in the beautiful Milton Keynes. <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> And uh, I turned up, I'd never been there before, and uh, I walked into the foyer of the school, uh, and uh, there was no one there, and I was meant to meet a teacher to do the assembly, nobody there at all, except for one boy, I would say aged about 13 or 14, and he was as pale as that pillar. He looked like he was going to faint. He was standing against the wall outside the head teacher's office. So I'm there, I said, hello, I said, uh, is Mrs. Jones around somewhere, please, uh, who does the assembly, uh, assemblies. And he said, uh, no, sir, I haven't seen her this morning. I said, good. I said, are you all right? And he looked so unwell. I said, do you need anything? He said, uh, no, I'm okay, sir. I said, good. I said, what's the matter? Are you sure? Is something the matter? He said, well, it was a Tuesday. He said, well, yesterday it was pouring with rain when we all had to get the buses home from school. Um, so I came out here into the foyer um, to get onto my bus, and somebody took that fire extinguisher off the wall because there were lots of people in here and boshed it down and sprayed it for a bit. I said, never. He said, yeah. I said, did you do it? He said, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he did. <laughs> Poor kid. He did know, right? He did know. He just didn't know whether to tell the head. <laughs> Listen, before I left, I did the assembly. I, had to, I asked the secretary if I could see the head teacher just to find out what happened. And, and he, did, he went for the bluff. And he said, no, sir, I didn't do it. And about, of course, about 12 staff had seen him do it from all over the place. So he got a double punishment, double detention. Uh, a smaller one for shooting off the fire extinguisher and a bigger one for telling a lie, which is quite clever, wasn't it? This boy went for the bluff. What's he doing with Jesus? Well, you can't bluff it out with the Son of God. All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Ay, 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 ay. So here's strike three. Watch this. This is, I mean, I might find it more fascinating than you, but uh, what I love here is the way that Jesus Christ is so generous to people like you and me. We come with our own agenda. We, we don't know it, really, but we, we come with our own agenda. Maybe a sense of curiosity about Christ, which is a wonderful thing. What is it all about? How do you get eternal life? Is there eternity? What does it mean? Could I be there? Could God help me with my life? What would it look like to know Christ personally? And there's absolutely nothing, nothing to criticize about coming to have a look at this. But the beautiful thing about Jesus uh, through his word, the Bible, is that he says to us, thanks for coming to have a look and a chat with me, sir, to the rich young ruler. L let's dig out what's really going on in your heart and in your mind and see if I can really help you get eternal life. Well, listen, the first thing you need to know is no one's good enough. I mean, it really doesn't matter if your mum and dad are a Christian, actually. Uh, I think that was, that was lovely, wasn't it, when we were listening to Lucy chat. Uh, where you come from is very important in framing life, of course, in so many ways. But in the end, uh, God doesn't have grandchildren. He, he has children. Every child from a Christian home must follow Christ themselves. And they have to, can't depend on somebody else. No one's good enough, no matter what your background, however nice it is. You can't keep the commandments. He says the same point, he says to the guy, nobody can do enough. Now, 
If you're not sure that you're a Christian tonight, this might be a real tender thing, you know, that I'm poking a finger on here. Really? But I'm, I'm, I mean, there's so many people who are bad in the world. I mean, surely my standard's enough for him to give me a go at this. And he says, no, 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 you, you've got the wrong question. I've got a better question and a better answer for you, he wants to say. And we'll come to that in a moment. But first, let's deal with the bluff. The one he left out, the one Jesus leaves out, is the 10th commandment, the 6th social commandment, which in older languages do not covet. Uh, don't be grasping. Don't be greedy. Don't be always chasing something else. Don't always be striving to be a cultural achiever above all things. Your looks your brains, I mean, none of these pertain to me, obviously. Your looks, your brains, your sporting prowess, your musical ability, your relationships, the people you know, beautiful things in life. But, but listen, don't always be chasing something else that you can attain, he says to the young guy. I know you're a success, but you've missed the main thing that gets you eternal life, and it's nothing to do with your own ability. Now, this is the crunch, and I thought it came across eloquently in Lucy's story. Nothing you can attain can get you eternal life. But here's the brilliant side of that. Flip it over. None of your failures can bar you from eternal life. Now you're talking. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are or how terrible you are. Both stand. In fact, it's nothing to do with you and your ability. Now, when this happens, look, let, let's go to the third, uh, third strike. Jesus is so kind. Jesus calls his bluff, verses 22 to 25. Let's have a look at them. When Jesus heard this, he said to the man, one thing you still lack, sell, sell all, you, all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Hold there for a minute. Uh, do, you, do you use the word tight? Do you, do you use that? Do you know what that means? I mean, drunk in some cultures. And in others, I'm, I'm really looking now to see if it's a nod or not. It means somebody who could peel an orange in their pocket with a boxing glove on rather than share some of it. Is that what you mean by tight? Yes, yes. Good, okay, tight. <laughs> Good, it's like Wales. <laughs> Good. Good. Jesus spots the man's problem. What's the worst thing to say to a tight person? Give it away. You see, this isn't about money. This isn't about not being able to come to heaven if you've got money. It's about self-sufficiency. It's about being all about me and what I can achieve. It's about being greedy. It's about being all about what I'm going to pull off. Uh, tight, tight didn't make sense to me until I was about eight. And uh, there was a man called Tom Tight in my street. No, no, there was. If you've read uh, Dylan Thomas Under Milk Wood, you'll know why. And if you haven't, have a read. Dylan Thomas Under Milk Wood. It's about West Wales uh, from years ago, from the 50s. Tom Tite was in my street, so I thought he was Mr. Tite, you see. Anyway, I soon found out he wasn't, because one day when I was eight in the summer holidays, I was kicking a ball against the wall outside my house, and Tom Sundays walked by and said, Hey, Graham, you're a bit noisy with that ball. Can you put it away? bit noisy up the street. So I said, sorry, Mr. Sundays, I'll put it away. Well, he went straight to my house, knocked the front door, called my mother. He said, your son's just called me Mr. Sundays. My mother was, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Off he went, hauled me inside, said, wait till your father gets home. I said, what? She said, what do you call him Tom Sundays for? I said, because you and daddy call him Tom Sundays. She said, he's not Tom Sundays, he's Tom Evans. I said, well, why do you call him Tom Sundays then? Oh, she said, don't be dopey. I said, don't be dopey. She said, he's very religious, but two-faced. 
Palm Sundays. They all fell into place at that moment. The whole street. <laughs> the whole street. You'll have to think about this later. Shall I give you a list of some of the people in the street? <laughs> Bill Bungalow. All of a sudden I went, Bill Bungalow. My father came home from work. I said, Dad, I said, I get now Tom Tight. Tom, Tom Sundays. John Tight, Tom said, what about Bill Bungalow? He said, come on, son. I said, well, Dad, I said, we all live in, you know, we've all got an upstairs, you know. He said, son, he said, Bill Bungalow, nothing upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> it went on, listen, it goes on. Evans above, Undertaker. Evans above. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas, Tom twice. And think about this later, die Central Eating. I always thought Central Eating was his name. At that point, I thought he was a plumber, obviously, but he wasn't. He only had one tooth in the center of his mouth. He'd lost all the others. Die Central Eating. <laughs> That'll take a while. Tell somebody what it means. Only one tooth. Jesus calls his bluff, you see. Oh, I know I've been mucking around a little bit here, but the worst thing you say to a tight person is, give it away. So Jesus is brilliant, really. He could have made fun of him. There were disciples around. We'll see as we draw to a close. There were other people around. He could have, he could have been rude to him. He could have said, listen, son, I've given you two chances. Get a grip on yourself. Seriously. And he's just subtle and discreet. Because, friends, this evening, the creator of the universe, the God of love, loves us so much that he would come into this world to actually give his own life on a cross on your behalf and mine. This is the love of the creator of the entire universe for you and I this evening. If he's drawn you here, be sure of this. That he's absolutely committed to giving you the opportunity this very night to work out that the question, what do I do to get eternal life, is a mistaken question, but I can give you the right question with the right answer right now. From the words of Jesus. He became very sad because he was very wealthy. That's horrid, isn't it? When he heard these things, verse 23, he became very sad for he's extremely rich. Can you picture his face falling? Do, do you think your face would fall at this point? Listen, I'm interested in Jesus. I really respect people I know. I'd like to work out how to do it. I think I can have a go at it. And perhaps Jesus will help me on my way and I'll do my best because I can be good enough and I can try and keep the rules properly. I, I really can. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. I don't need anything from you. I've got everything for you. But before you can get everything from me, I need you to accept that you've got nothing to give me. And this is the hardest thing for all of us to do. It really is actually to say, I bring nothing to Jesus other than my rebellion. Nothing other than my rebellion. Look at how the story ends this evening. 24 and 25 is where we draw it in. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Some commentators on this say that the eye of the needle was a, a small gate in Jerusalem to get into the city so small that it was funny to think of a camel going through it because it was too low. So perhaps people would have laughed when he said that. You didn't because you don't have camels in Newcastle. Um, or it could just be camel and eye of a needle. So I think there's a bit of lightness in what he says here, but he's basically saying, if you think you can offer me anything, you can't have eternal life. 
I'm going to, I'll just say it once more so there's no noise around it. Jesus says, if you think you can offer me anything, you can never have eternal life. I know. It's odd, isn't it? Almost disgraceful. And it does cause a shock because look at what people say. 26. Those who heard it said, well, who can be saved then? I mean, you can imagine the people looking around going, the disciples go, what? He's a class act. He's an absolutely great guy. He's a diamond. I mean, he can't come to heaven. No one's coming to heaven. It's a shock. It's a shock statement. And here comes the punchline. You've got to picture Jesus looking at them, looking around the group and saying, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. This man may have been sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. If he was sincere, then he was sincerely wrong. If you don't feel your bankruptcy before God, you cannot understand what Jesus has done. Right at this moment, age, stage, background, culture, church-going history, we're right at the heart of the diagnostic of the human condition. If this evening you don't know that as you stand before God, the creator of the universe, the holy one, the perfect one, and as you stand before him now, you need to look square on, straight in his eyes, as it were. And you need to look at yourself and you need to say to yourself, I want eternal life, but actually the Bible teaches all I'm going to get when I meet God is a judgment that says, you heard the story of the rich young man, you heard very clearly that the Bible says you have no rights, you cannot do anything to get to heaven. In fact, you are bankrupt because you can't help but covet and be self-sufficient and try and cut deals with me. It's a vain thing to do. Do you know you're bankrupt before me and you will be judged by me on the day I meet you? This is the New Testament story. And the Bible says when we leave this world, we will stand before Jesus Christ and he will say to us, as he says to the rich young man, you're not good enough. You cannot have life with me beyond this grave. And the Bible says we will be separated from God to hell and judged by God eternally. So it's a big moment when you ask Jesus, how do I get eternal life? Because when the answer comes back, this could be the most important moment, not just of your life now, but for where you'll be in 10,000 years' time. Because God is an eternal God. Here's the key. Christianity is not what you do. If you want it as simple as possible, it's not what you do, D-O. It's what Jesus has done, D-O-N-E, for me. It isn't what you do. It's what he's done. That's the difference. And that's the line that you have to decide which side you stand on this evening. No one can boast when they're a Christian. Nobody who's met Jesus Christ, nobody for whom Jesus Christ has died on a cross and risen and they have accepted him and his spirit has come into them. Nobody will say to you, I'm good enough. Ask somebody who you know trusts Christ personally, tonight or tomorrow. Do you think you're good enough? They'll say, not a chance. 
I can't do anything, but I know someone who's done everything. And that's why they have joy. That's why there's joy. Now flip the misery to the joy. The cross meant that Jesus is death saw the only one who was ever good enough, the only one who kept the commandments, the only one who didn't cover anything but the love of God. He died for me and you, and he paid the price for my self-sufficiency and rebellion, which the Bible calls sin, which is easily understood as a small s, an enormous i, and a small n, because I'm at the middle and God is not. And at the moment Christ beats death, he holds out his hand to you and me, he says, hey, you'll never be able to be good enough, but I am, and I've paid for you. And I will take the price, the judgment that you deserve from my holy father, and I paid, come here. No deals, no cutting a deal. No, I'll do my best. Give me a hand, Jesus. You know you can do with me. No, no, no. No. And that is the way to eternal life. So, how do we conclude? At 20 to 8 on Sunday night. Date, 27th of February. 20 to 8. Where do you stand right now? 742 tonight I think there are two alternatives before us this may be the first time in your life that you've ever come face to face with what Jesus is saying to you so front on that it's actually astonishing as you go through it now the Bible asks that you do two things one you turn to Christ you fully acknowledge that before God you can bring nothing, nothing. You come empty and bankrupt to him and say, I'm sorry for thinking I could ever cut deals with you. Thanks that I've heard the truth from your scriptures tonight. And you trust in Christ. You put your hope in the death and resurrection of Jesus for you. He paid the price out of love. Turn to him and trust him now. It was my privilege to do that in February 84 and 59. I was 21, 21. It's, it's just life. Same personality, same kind of way of being, but this deep, 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 deep certainty that God is mine and I'm his. And he will never leave me. Could that be the time? Could today be the time when you say, I turn and trust in Christ? Remember, mums and dads were Christians. Grandparents were Christians. Best friends were Christians. God has no grandchildren. Only first-hand relationships. And finally... I don't want to end without knowing that I'm in a church on a Sunday night, so there'll be a lot of people in here who say, oh, I am a Christian. Indeed, the majority will say that tonight. I know what you just said is true. Well, for those who want to give their life to Christ for the first time, want to start with Christ tonight, and for those who've been to church for the last 30 years knowing they know Christ, can I end by helping the person who might become a Christian understand how it works being a Christian? Here we are on Sunday night, in church with people we'd never normally hang out with. Really? Isn't it? Such an eclectic group of people. To you, dear brother or sister who follows Jesus tonight, we come to church once a week for one super, super, super reminder that the way in is the way on. If you've been a Christian 50 years or five months, the way in for the person who isn't a Christian, is the way on. So tonight, can I remind you, you deserve nothing at all. 
So have you screwed it up a couple of times this week? Yes. Does the cross cover it? Yes. Doesn't matter how brilliant a week you've had or how rubbish a week you've had. You could never be good enough. And you could never be too bad for the finished work of Christ on the cross. So you see, you come to church to remember this. And maybe for the 5,000th time tonight, you say, I turn to Christ. I deserve nothing from Jesus. And when Ian said at the beginning, we sing songs, to know and feel what we believe. We'll close with a song, to know and feel what a Christian believes. I am forgiven. And any mess I make has been paid for by Christ, and I make so many. And he never changes. The way into the Christian life is the way on tonight. You should walk out of here if you know Christ personally and say, I can do nothing, but he can do everything. Hallelujah. Come on, you say. You are with me. You are always with me. I've got hope in my failures. That there's nothing I can do. He did it all. Whoa. What a hope. So for those of you who know him, turn to him again tonight and trust him. The Savior on the cross and risen from the grave is your Savior. You deserve nothing and you have everything. And on we go, isn't it? On we go to another week. That's why coming to church is so precious to read, to pray, to sing, to hear the Bible, and to remember this, that this is life. There was a man who nearly had it all. Don't take the pillow tonight as the woman who nearly had it all. To have Christ is to have it all. What a hope. What a privilege. What a gift. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that this story is in Luke's account of the life of Jesus. I pray for those of us who would say, I didn't know that before I come in, or I didn't grasp that, that we may walk out of here turned and trusting in Christ. And I pray for myself as I pray for others who have known you for some time that we may be glad that we've remembered tonight that I can't do anything, even if I've been a Christian 30 years. You have to keep forgiving. You forgive, you forgive, you forgive, and you paid for it on the cross. And that I can trust you to be my Savior and Lord and friend this week, regardless of my weaknesses. And as we sing together, we rejoice that these things are true. May our hearts jump for joy now as we sing together. Amen.